Um, what we what we've done in, over the last uh, the last uh, three years is been working on mountain pine beetle in relation to in relation to prescribed burns, and and uh, one of the one of the things that happened, um, the things that we did la the, the, over the last two years, we've had a we've had a serious case of the Goldilocks effect, of either too hot or too dry, or hot, hot or too cold, and uh, we've we've tried to burn a number of sites uh, multiple times and always failed. Uh, we had very little success in getting fires off. So we, we actually did work on, on, on this issue in, in, um, on a project that the Forest Service started in 2008, I believe, by Dave Schroeder. Dave, uh, they produced, uh, they, they girdled some, lodge, some jack pine stands in the northeastern part of the, of the province. So we've got a lot of this in, in western Canada. And the issue is how to how to uh, how to lodge pole pine uh, adapt to this. Uh, they're they're typically they're adapted to regenerate after after wildfires, and uh, we've got this is the this is how they're they've evolved. They've evolved with cones on the trees. The cones are uh, they're largely still up in this particular stand that was killed by a mountain pine beetle two years earlier. Um, and in this case, they're they're uh, they're still up, largely, but not all of them. And uh, we're we're seeing cone cone survival, uh, cone cone uh, decay and breakdown. We have closed cones in some cases. Most of them are still closed at that stage. Some of them are partially opened, and some of them are completely opened at that stage. And and what happens during during uh, during the red phase? There's we have flexible stems and a lot, of, uh, a lot of movement of the stems, but brittle twigs. And there's a, there's a large amount of droppage of cones at that stage. And you can, you can detect this, we have detected it. Cones hit the ground, they, there's, there's warmer conditions. If, they're, if they can find a light spot on the ground, they will open. And uh, some of the seed is released, but not all of them. There's some of the, some of the seed is sitting there in closed cones, and you can see the one on the on the, the, the left side of the screen is closed, and that cone can can, can become buried, and the and the seeds will remain alive in that buried cone, and uh, you could re-expose it. Most of the time, they'll they'll eventually rot, but they could be re-exposed later on. Squirrels and, and mice do a lot of uh, uh, recovery of these seeds and, and cones. Uh, the squirrels clip them off, or they move the cones around on the ground that fall, and the mice pick up the cones, the seed that actually is dispersed. So you get the seed bank, the aerial seed bank, some of it is dispersed uh, with single seeds dropping from the, from the canopy, and, uh, and some of it is dispersed as closed cones dropping from the canopy. And so this, uh, this uh, a section on the right here is a sequence of closed cones. They can hit the ground. Some of them are buried. Some of them uh, go in, uh, into the into the into a immediate seed bank, and some of the seed bank is actually lost from the trees directly as opening cones. But most of it is 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 bad news. Most of it's eaten by squirrels, rotted soil detritus. That's where most of it ends up. So most of this seed's quite ineffective, as Ellen and, and Anne showed. It doesn't really doesn't really produce much. That doesn't mean there's still not lots of it. There's, uh, by six years, six years, this is Francois Test's work, six years, there's still 15 million, million cones per hectare. And uh, there's about a million uh, seeds per hectare in the forest floor that's buried in cones, closed cones in the forest floor. So this could be brought back out again. The seed itself is, is remaining viable on the trees for pretty good for 15 years. So at 15 years after production, this is the viability. 15 years, you don't really see much loss in viability of closed cones. Now, the, the real issue is, can we use fire as a, as a regeneration tool? And here we've got uh, ASRD, or EASRD, uh, doing some prescribed burns. I guess it was SRD at the time. Uh, doing the prescribed burns at this Archer Lake. And uh, these these uh, cones are 
our uh, the questions that we're asking here that Maria Sharp and and uh, Hygen Hygen Wang uh, asked are will the cones open from from ground fires and secondly uh, is this the, the right thing to prepare a seed bed well the answer is yes and yes uh, but these are the this is the the jack pine stand that was that was burnt um, and you can see the girdling effect the girdle trees at the bottom here some of the girdle girdle trees so Hai Jing uh, asked the question how much fire is needed to open the cones and uh, and she found very quickly that uh, dead dead trees it doesn't take nearly as much uh, heat to open the cones as on a living tree. So the cone opening is on a surface fire, surface ground fire that's that's less than a meter of flame uh, will open these short trees uh, pretty well. Well, it's not hardly opened at all in the living trees. Well, you need a, a more of a more of a fire to open the uh, partial crown fire before you get the cone opening on the living trees. Now the question is about seed beds then. That, that's the that's the other thing. When you have a landscape burn like this, you have, and it burns across the landscape. These seed beds, like this, are largely a terrible seed bed for for regeneration of, uh, of pine uh, seedlings. But a fire can clean it up. Fire takes away most of that most of that debris and most of the the seed bed is is a, is uh, available now, and you get all kinds of things regenerating, including these. Uh, including these uh, liverworts and aspen seedlings in this particular scene but the fire is a is a great seed bed and we that's that it's been shown many many times in the literature uh, that that's a good it is a good seed bed and so fire fire can be uh, quite a useful for for generating generating a, a, a good seed bed and maria sharp going to these sites and uh, maria and hygiene both have posters up show that if you don't burn, this is the control, that's the number of seedlings per hectare. If you don't burn versus if you have surface burns and con continuous, I'm not going to get into the details of the graph, but the point of it is if you don't burn, you get almost nothing. And um, so you need to prepare that seed bed. So do you need to prepare the seed beds to get these, get these little pine seedlings to establish. Okay, so what are the alternatives, alternative ways of getting a seed bed established? This is, uh, we, we did some uh, demonstrations, I wouldn't call this an experiment, but we were going to have an experiment, but we ran out of, uh, ran out of good weather for uh, uh, burning in the last year, it just rained all summer. So, but we did do this experiment where we were, uh, this demonstration where we're going to look at uh, forest floor disturbance using site preparation using this very small, very small backhoe. A very small backhoe is probably a good idea for this kind of treatment because it can go between the trees. You either have to go big or very small. And this is very small, uh, about a 20, 20 horsepower machine or 25 horsepower machine. And this was a rich site, a very rich site. So we decided to become aggressive with treatments. This is uh, on Warehouser's Saddle Hill area. Um, aggressive with treatment and fairly large, large uh, exposures on the forest floor. Otherwise, this area will fill up with uh, fireweed and other, other vegetation over the next five years and we will be pretty hopeless as, as a regeneration site. Uh, it's too dark. Seed is expected to rain down over the next decade after mountain pine beetle. On most sites, uh, forest floor disturbance is needed and I've just cited Anne's recent paper to support that but uh, as Ellen sh showed they already knew the answer they they projected it before they actually did the work use prescribed fire or mechanical site preparation to prepare a seed bed and open cones now I'm going to talk very briefly about a couple of uh, issues related to uh, mountain pine beetle and what we might do for regeneration on on some of the the areas that are uh, that are badly hit, this is uh, north of Grand Prairie, uh, Peace River Valley in the background. Um, 
and we've got a large amount of these kinds of stands if that don't appear to be harvested and they never will likely be harvested what's going to happen with them and here's an example we do know what what this site looks like we, we spent quite a bit of time on this particular site it's in the saddle hills um, it's on a it's on a boreal mixed wood site or uh, lower lower foothills uh, lower lower uh, boreal forest site and and it's rich and so if you go into the understory in that particular location this is where we did the site preparation you will find that there is there is considerable amounts of advanced growth spruce to 200 300 stems per hectare it's not enough to stock the area it's got a large amount of of uh, tall shrubs medium-sized shrubs dense vegetation we would project that without any kind of uh, disturbance of the soil on this particular location you will get virtually no regeneration on this site so you would need to disturb this kind of site to get regeneration end of story um, the other thing that's important about it is that I'm showing this slide again because it's it shows that the that uh, there's a lot of shade um, probably only about less than 40 percent light transmission into this into the stand during that during the red phase and even in the in the uh, in this particular scene was actually entering the gray phase and is still less than less than 50 percent light and this is not a great place to grow a uh, lodgepole pine particularly on a rich site that's going to be filled up with vegetation so with with this is why you need an aggressive treatment on, on a location like this if you don't do this you will not likely achieve anything that's going to get a tree that will be established 10 years later the third thing that's interesting about this location now this this picture I think I took at uh, year four uh, so probably the first tree that was killed is is in right in the middle of the scene and then there are other trees that are younger uh, in terms of they're just just still in the red phase and you can see green trees in the background and they we expect to see these green trees to be retained and I think the beetles had already moved on in this particular location so you're going to have some lodgepole pine in these stands but it won't be much and so in terms of the next disturbance maybe they will provide the seed source for the next disturbance um, without regeneration without without uh, soil treatment I don't think you're going to get anything but there still will be a little bit of lodgepole pine left in this in this forest because of these red trees these green trees so some of them are still going to be in there now we can switch switch locations in the province go to go to the upper foothills this location is uh, Upper Foothills, probably a DE ecosite, um, lodgepole pine with a black spruce understory. And in this particular location, there is sufficient uh, black spruce to be, be considered stocked after the, after the lodgepole pine is killed. So what do you do with this site? Are you going to log it? Are you going to salvage log it? Would you salvage log it without any kind of special treatments or special imp, uh, special uh, uh, consideration of the black spruce so there's a there's a real issue here as to what to do with with locations like this Chris Hawkins recent paper would suggest that we could uh, walk away from these and they still would produce something in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, lava cut um, and timber supply um, but we could do this as well if you're going to salvage log this is what you should, probably should be doing is doing some sort of a partial harvest to retain the, this understory black spruce. That's assuming you believe that the black spruce is going to be productive enough to, to justify this kind of this kind of treatment. Um, so this is something that's probably should be on the agenda for for uh, even for the salvage logging systems. Is that we should be doing if we're going to do salvage logging where we have advanced growth, we should be trying to protect that, that advanced growth. Now here's, a, here's another scene that uh, we have some of these in Alberta where we got balsam fir and subalpine fir understory. 
is the subalpine fur or balsam fur worth protecting? These are really tough questions. Is that is that is that is that worth uh, spending additional money on silviculture to protect it? Uh, Rick is shaking his head no. I would uh, I would agree with him for many eco regions, for the, particularly the places where the, there's drought prone conditions it's periodically. I would say that it's probably not worth protecting it because uh, these will likely uh, they may not they may not be uh, successful anyway during uh, the next drought they'll drop out because the balsam fir is balsam fir is particularly drought tolerant intolerant rather and so we would not not spend energy on this but it, if there is more of this would we spend energy on it I I don't I don't this is probably not enough we've only got three 300 cents per hectare here perhaps so we have another we have another ecocyte like this this one is a uh, another ecocyte no advanced growth in this in this location um, what to what do you do here if you did, did not salvage log this if, if you do the standard salvage log and then kick it into the normal silviculture well you'll bring it back to a logical pine stand using uh, normal silvicultural techniques like dry scarification. Uh, but if you salvage logged it, or if you don't salvage log it, what will happen to it? What, what, what's the progression on this particular stand? And if it's filled with this, and most of, most of uh, the upper foothills and, and sites are filled with, uh, with a thick feather moss layer, if it's got rotten logs, some of them will, will, will have some trees on it, like Ellen and Anne suggest. But if it doesn't have the rotten logs, I don't think you're going to see much regeneration. And it'll stay there for quite a long time in a very stable, uh, way grossly understocked state for a long period of time. But if you get some of this happening, there'll be, they'll, during the at year 8 to 15 or whenever these trees start to come down uh, and you get tip-ups you could get exposure of mineral soil and that might flip it over into another into another mode where some you'll get some regeneration occurring so I think I think uh, depends on what kind of what kind of uh, uh, terrain and what kind of conditions we have we'll get a little bit of a little bit of pine back into those locations through this mode and through uh, rotten logs, but it's going to be grossly understocked. That's that would be the the outcome, I'd say. The other thing that I would project is, is we're going to see uh, um, a rapid evolution if we do have a large amount of mountain pine beetle and, and we don't uh, harvest it, don't salvage log it. We'll get we'll get considerable evolution towards um, selection for non serotony and uh, we have a, a cone system that's it's really aimed at forest fires for regeneration. I think we're going to see more non serotony in the future. If we, if we do get regeneration uh, in these systems, that's probably it's going to happen from cones that open up more readily. Um, I think in a conclusion, uh, so the rich sites are going to shift to other tree species and shrubs, and pine is going to play a really minor, minor role in, in those sites. That's that would be uh, that's that's my vision for the for what we'll see in in uh, in boreal forests and northern forests. Is pine is going to drop out as a dominant species in these systems if we don't uh, if we don't do any treatments. Um, many stands will persist from advanced growth and residual pines. Well, the the species is going to persist to persist on that basis, and. Uh, Pure pine stands with poor sites with feather mosses have very low stocking for decades. That's that would be where I would another projection and selection selection for non serotonin and shade tolerance. It's probably going to go on. So the the real issue is that we're probably going to see a lot less pine in uh, in the forests that that are not salvage logged uh, in the short term. And the short term, I mean the next couple hundred years. Um, in the evolution of the things, but uh, so we're gonna—it's going to be a shift over away from pine towards other other uh, species. I would like to uh, remember uh, Song Ru is uh, is uh, another supervisor for.
for uh, Hygiene and, and uh, Maria, and you can see their posters, and we thank, the, thank all the funding agencies and the people who helped us in these projects.